Okay, welcome back. It's 3.40 and let's not delay. We have one hour for this very interesting topic. We have a panel discussion on responsible disclosure, responsible disclosure process, policy, and all that is re related uh, to them. And to bring us, all of us, uh, on the same page, I will try to give a very short introduction. First of all, our panelists. They are sitting there with their name tags. I'm very happy to have Natalie Fallot from the Netherlands, Eva Ilves from the Ministry of Defense, Varis uh, Tevans from CERTLV, and Kirill Solovyos uh, as an IT uh, security researcher. What is responsible disclosure? We've heard uh, that quite a lot, even from the minister in the morning, so I'm very uh, glad that I don't have to go into very uh, big details on that. But in general, uh, what is the most important, perhaps, part of this discussion, or at least one of the important parts, is that security researcher, if he finds something by accident or on purpose or whatever ways, he has several choices. And in our all interests would be that he choose uh, to tell the owner of the information system, to tell the vendor, and not to go uh, public with it immediately, or not to sell it to the black market. And we also wouldn't like that he does nothing, because that also doesn't solve our problems. The problem space is big, and I'm not going to go into that, but we will use it later, perhaps, if we uh, don't get questions from the audience. Uh, but before we go uh, to the esteemed panelists, uh, I will tell you, uh, in, the, in short, what is the situation in Latvia. Uh, as, uh, again, Minister pointed out, there uh, is very strong will to try to put responsible disclosure in the law. And Latvia would be the first country that does that. Others have different approaches, they have policies that prosecutors can follow. We want to go for the law. And since we are the first ones, it's very difficult. We don't have anyone to look at. What we have to do in order to be uh, the first ones, let's say, we have to define the responsible disclosure process and also define when, when this liability is waived, what are the uh, elements that have to be followed. And very shortly, the process as it is foreseen now in this proposed legislation is as follows. If the res uh, when the researcher is looking for a vulnerability, he documents what he does, he makes log files, screenshots, so that he can later prove what, what was the process, how he found the vulnerability, and that he didn't do anything else, uh, didn't go deeper from the point where he found vulnerability so that the uh, minimum uh, damage was done. So that's uh, the first duties for the researcher. And when something, oh, and one more thing to mention, legislation would apply only to state local authorities or uh, automated systems that are for the state. So basically it's state sector, it's not private sector we are talking about. So when the researcher finds bug, he goes to CERT. In our case in Latvia we have two CERTs, it's military CERT and CERT LV. So if something is related to uh, Ministry of Defense or National Armed Forces, it would be military CERT. In all other cases it would be us. And CERT is the one that verifies if the vulnerability really exists, because it might well happen that researcher is inexperienced and it's a mistake. So in that case, if it's a mistake, CERT would tell the researcher that, sorry, it's not a vulnerability, it's something else, or, or you made some mistakes. In case it is a vulnerability, CERT is the uh, intermediary that would go to the institution uh, that takes care of particular system and informs them about the problem. Institution will have 90 days, or in some cases it can be extended up to 180 days, so six months, three months or six months, to fix the vulnerability. When the vulnerability is fixed, the institution informs CERT, and CERT informs the researcher that the vulnerability is fixed and the researcher can go public with it. So that's, in very uh, nutshell, the process, how it is envisaged in the uh, proposal uh, that is now uh, put in front of the uh, Cabinet of Ministers. And this is where we stand with our discussion. We, I would like, uh, I hope we will have 
possibility to discuss several things. Now I'm turning from you to panelists. Uh, at the beginning, maybe we can look at responsible disclosure in general and see why it's good, why it's bad. And then uh, we can go a bit more in detail on how we think we will do it in Latvia and uh, what are the pros and cons in that process. Uh, if you have questions from the audience, raise your hands. We'll try to get all the questions in. Uh, and to start, I would like to uh, ask all panelists uh, one by one uh, to uh, express what is like one or two main challenges in the responsible disclosure process as it is now without the legislation in place. So Natalie, would you like to start? The question, uh, what are the uh, main challenges of responsible disclosure process? Main challenges, as it is now, without the legislation. I think that legal certainty is certainly a challenge, so you don't know what you'll face uh, when you do a responsible disclosure. And it's quite arbitrary at the moment. So uh, it's up, in the Netherlands at least, it's up to the organization to see if they press charges or not. Um, and it's a case-by-case -case evaluation, so you never really know what you're facing if you do a disclosure, and it's really up to the organization on how they, um, how they handle a disclosure. Okay, Yava? <laughs> yes, uh, maybe I will use the uh, experience of Swed Swedbank as we, before we started to, before we launched the process in the ministry, we discussed with a with number of, of people, and as, we, as it was mentioned already before, Swedbank is implementing responsible disclosure. So actually, it was their, uh, their uh, I think, reference is a very good how it was before and after once they introduced. And exactly like you mentioned, that certainty and understanding of the process, because before responsible disclosure policy, it was not that uh, there were not vulnerabilities and that there were no people who not discovered. Of course, they did, and of course, they reported, but it was a very uncertain process. It always created a very hectic reaction. It was always a worry up from the board down to up, down, and all the other directions. And it was a hectic process finding who is doing what and do we respond, do we ignore, uh, is it serious, is it... Uh, and uh, so once the process has been established in the bank, actually everybody sleeps more peacefully, everybody knows how to react and what to do, and I think that that is exactly the gain, you have a certainty. Uh, as we start to introduce and as we start to discuss that process, at least uh, from my experience as far as I, I was in the office as... <laughs> Uh, dealing with that more. I have, a, I think the, the biggest challenge is that I would like to mention is the trust and uh, it actually is a very difficult process because regardless of in which audience you sit and uh, regardless whether you are a hacker or you are a system owner, there is distrust <laughs> and in a way with this process uh, we have to educate and establish that trust for hackers actually to trust to test, the, to test the sites or, or, or products and uh, report, to trust the process that they will not find themselves behind the bars. And uh, for information system owners actually to be open for that cooperation instead of uh, um, being suspicious of everyone who is hacking in, actually doing that for, f with, with uh, malicious uh, intentions. So I feel that uh, while we kind of uh, develop and pursue a clear policy and we see the reason why we are doing, it's actually we get hit <laughs> whichever audience we go. So it is a very challenging process to, to actually educate and establish that, uh, that trust on, on both sides. Okay, Varis, well, uh, I have different order here, but we can change it later. <laughs> Okay, so I think that one of the challenges is the com that we don't have common understanding uh, among general public researchers and, and law enforcement agencies uh, what, what the responsible disclosure is and uh, how important that is. And uh, on the importance, I think that this late, latest uh, incident with Krebson uh, website that, that was, it looks like it was the biggest DDoS ever, so again, new records have been have been reached on, on the DDoS and uh, IoT devices were involved 
It is something that uh, Kirill already mentioned in his presentation, uh, but uh, probably the, uh, the emphasis was not on the usage of those devices for DDoS purposes, but this is something we can see also from the SERP perspective. So uh, with IoT being so popular and, and uh, the industry uh, is, is, is pushing it uh, also quite a lot, I think we are not on the same pace on the consumer uh, side and understanding what, how, how important it is and that con consumers should uh, demand security. Uh, so yeah, those, those parts on understanding I think is, is critical also to implement the RDP. And uh, I think it was all also mentioned, but I want to emphasize that not only legal aspects are, are important here with the RDP, but also the, the well-defined process and appropriate communication during the whole uh, RDP phases. Okay, thank you. And Kirill, your opinion? <laughs> Thanks. So for a security researcher, lack of clear framework clearly makes researchers spend time on something he or she should not be spending time on. And it's not only a waste of, in most cases, a highly qualified professional doing administrative work. Um, it can also lead to some disillusionment about the whole process as, as I concluded during making of my presentation before. Um, it, is, it is a dangerous thing, so we have to make the responsible disclosure process as fluid as possible, as streamlined as possible for all parties, the researcher and, and, and of course the owner of the system. I think it's as important to make it easy for them. Well, the challenge here is of course how, how can we do it, but it, it should never be the case that the process is so complicated that the researcher or, or the vendor have to have to you know spend a lot of time micromanaging each other, and usually the problem the problem appears for um, organizations where they do not have clear responsible disclosure uh, policy in place. But as uh, some panelists already mentioned, if you don't have RDP, it doesn't matter that you don't have vulnerabilities. Furthermore, it doesn't matter that you do not get reports. Well, you're actually lucky if you still get reports without an RDP. Um, and, and, and that is the case. So we need a streamlined process. Um, different kinds of framework can help, so we, we need something. I, I agree with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, just maybe to give an overview uh, that in Latvia at the moment, uh, Svetbank is the uh, biggest organization that published their responsible disclosure policy already a year ago or so. Uh, well, uh, at CERTEL, we, we've published our policy not very long time ago, but uh, we've been receiving reports already for some time. Uh, so those are the first, um, first uh, places where you see it. Uh, if the law uh, is accepted, then it would apply to all state uh, institutions, which is a huge increase. And of course, it will, uh, there are a lot of questions how uh, organizations will be able to ha handle it. So my next question would be, uh, how do you see the role of government in all this? Uh, not only, uh, so in Latvia we foresee that government will be the first one to show example uh, that well we accept responsible disclosure uh, notices, we uh, act upon them, etc., etc. But are there other role that government should take up? For example, uh, supporting some zero day findings or perhaps even establishing bug bounty programs. What do you think, uh, what's uh, what governments should do. Well, you can choose your order. I'm not going to, to say anymore who is about to start. Well, okay, so um, it, is, it, it is quite a political question, I would say. Um, I, I myself, uh, I, I'm a libertarian, so I think governments should do as, as little as possible, but there's a huge, there's a huge uh, catch here. Uh, Will all the other entities without the government do enough? So I think the answer for uh, responsible disclosure in Europe is no, not yet. So we're not there yet. So uh, 
keeping in mind that that personally I would think government should not you know interfere with with, with people should inter interfere with people's lives as little as possible um, I think RDP is is uh, a place for for government to do that interference to provide some framework um, now if, if we start to look at Latvian case uh, slowly here focus on that um, well it's it is an interesting idea but uh, working working with this uh, legislation uh, more and more and uh, and considering how it might get implemented and where it is right now slides that uh, Baiba showed comparing to where it was originally when it was just an idea um, I'd say well it's it's become quite formal as it sometimes happens uh, when, when, when the government touches uh, things. Um, so the question is, will, will this legislation um, you know, help, help uh, hackers and, and, and actually attract more people to responsible disclosure process or will it serve the other purpose? I guess I, I, I find myself in a government role. <laughs> well, I think uh, you are right in the sense that uh, government, of course, uh, it's a very popular to say, especially on IT, on digital areas, is that uh, let go let government do less because less actually enables uh, the digital digital field to be more creative and, and more successful. But uh, I think uh, that clarity and that process, uh, one has to start somewhere and. Uh, I don't exclude that in some other countries that can be a big uh, companies that can actually lead the process because I think once something works out and it becomes a success story, it's kind of multiplies then itself. Uh, I think we have found ourselves in situations that uh, in our case we need a government push from that. I think uh, we have our own very rational thinking behind it is not to I mean, we obviously would like to change the society and, and, and change many things, but even if we look in our own backyard in the government resources, we understand that we have a limited capacity. We have a limited capacity of people, of knowledge, of skills. We have endless information systems and resources that are digitally connected or used and, and so, so on so far. And, uh, uh, like uh, any other small nation, we have to be a creative in finding our ways out. And uh, while we have people who have a knowledge and skill and interest, I think we have to be able to establish that, that way how to cooperate and then benefit from those who maybe can see and notify of things that we don't see it in government side. So there is a quite a big rationale is that actually to benefit from government side. Where, where we can, cannot, uh, cannot afford maybe or, or not having enough resources ourselves. And I think by that, like you said, in a, in a slogan way, government to behave like an example or create an example, it, it is, I think, a simple way, very simplified way, but I think it works in practice. If something is successful and if it works, I really hope that the government can multiply it in a broader and a broader society, and, and it's more companies or, or, or structures would find it attractive to use. So uh, besides that, I don't, I don't think there's, of course there's a multiple ways how one does education, and it can be also events, it can be you know, events like hackathons and, and all kind of ed education and awareness rising events, but I think we need address that process and formal part, because that's something that is not that's something that currently is very uncertain and unclear, and that's, that uh, we can't escape without being involved from the government side as, as long as the, the role of drafting the laws and implementing them uh, from one side is coming from the government. Okay, yes, if you have any other comments, or, or we can also, how you feel about this question, if you want, you can comment, or we can also move to other. <laughs> things. <laughs> so, uh, I have a f very few comments. So, uh, I think that the formal part here is, uh, is, uh, can be visible in our case because we are trying to protect the researcher officially, like changing the criminal uh, law and, and stuff. And uh, 
with, with, with lawyers, I think you, you just can go other way if you, if you want to do that. So this is, this is why it happens like, like in, a formal, in a formal way. Uh, I think uh, it is quite, quite uh, different in, in Netherlands, for example, which is, which is uh, taken as, a, as an example for RDP a lot of, in a lot of cases where they have it, it uh, well established and uh, I guess it's even you, you tried, they tried to, to make it formal through the support of, of uh, Judge, general judge or, or whatever it is, but it's not a criminal law modification. So yeah, this is this is one thing. And uh, another thing, I think that RDP is a certain level of, of IT security maturity uh, in the in the society and, and, and country. So if we, as a, as a, as a country, we think that we have reached this level, then uh, from the government side, I think that what they can do what the government can do is make sure that they will react accordingly when, uh, when RDP cases arise. Thank you. In not to get carried away with uh, what I have in front of me, I would like to ask uh, if you have any questions. Yes, there is a hand. Good. Hello, Carl Spodinch, Sir Talvi. Uh, I have a question. Uh, regarding the current proposal in, in Latvia, I see it is a little bit like a 50% solution. I mean that it only applies to the, to the public sector. Uh, what are the legal challenges for applying something similar for the, uh, for the private sector? And uh, if there are like uh, huge legal challenges, are there any other ways how maybe a carrot approach would, would work? To, because uh, I see that there is, a, for, a, for a researcher, uh, sometimes it's difficult to understand where uh, pu public sector ends and private sector starts, especially with everything being a service and cloud and whatnot, so uh, difficult to, to see where, where maybe the vulnerability is either on the, on, the, on the government side or already somewhere in the private infrastructure. Okay, who feels like? Well, well, I don't know. I, I can give some partly maybe answer. Well, I think government can't over-regulate private, private sector. And uh, of course, if we start somewhere, we start with our own, with our own uh, sort of uh, resources. So uh, I don't really see how we can regulate private, private sector on one hand. On the other hand, uh, if we look at sweat banks, then we can see that it works without any regulation. So it actually, for private sector, uh, it's much easier. It takes a boss who understands the situation and it can be ad adapted without any, any problems. Of course, legal, legal aspects are there, but uh, as I understand from the sweat banks, they have not had up so far a cases where they would have to go to the court, that they have been able to handle the situation uh, within the given framework and find solution. So uh, I see it more for, for us that uh, it, if it really works on government sector, it just becomes a good, good example or a good experience that can be used uh, uh, for others. And uh, I think that's one. And of course, in a legal, legal aspect, if we learn, and there's, it's, not a, it's not, a, not a secret that sort of court systems and judges and prosecutors, the digital field is also completely unknown. And so if we can create a precedent, if we can uh, sort of give a knowledge for them how to handle these situations, then if that's something that will be dealt in, on government systems, then it will start to apply, or it will be easier to understand similar cases in the private sector, so. But I think it's in general, we cannot uh, over-regulate and interfere in the private sector, then we have to look it from, I mean, it regulates from different angles. It's like a private data if the private uh, sector processes, but then it's a uh, different fields by fields. Okay, Nathalie? <laughs> yeah, so I'm not that familiar with Latvian criminal law, to be honest, but uh, from what I understand is that 
uh, where it is possible to do self-regulation for the private sector on responsible disclosure in Latvia, it's not possible to use the same system for the public sector. Since your criminal law has certain provisions that prevents the public sector from including responsible disclosure and thus uh, exempting criminal liability for public sector vulnerabilities, since they have to be notified, I understood. Um, so I think that's probably one of the reasons for you to uh, regulate responsible disclosure for public sector while not regulating for private, since there it is possible to do it through self-regulation. Okay, thanks. Uh, other questions from you? I'm actually curious about uh, this uh, legal disclosure process, uh, not uh, yeah, responsible disclosure process from the legal perspective. I assume that knowledge about the vulner vulnerability itself is uh, kind of intellectual property of that researcher. How does it happen in this way? Does this responsible disclosure process somehow regulate this uh, licensing of knowledge to be used to actually fix this vulnerability? That's a very good question. Um, in the Netherlands, we don't include that, so we don't say that you get intellectual property over the knowledge. Um, but I don't think it's a question that's ever been asked in the Netherlands, so maybe we should look into that. Um, there are some issues with uh, the knowledge about vulnerabilities, especially if you look at cross-border cases, also through the Wassenaar Agreement. It's an international agreement that prevents knowledge about vulnerabilities being exported from one country to another. Uh, and that's something that the Netherlands is also discussing in that group. So when the Wassenaar Agreement is being reviewed, uh, we feel that these kinds of questions should be asked and should put into the agreement. So how to handle knowledge about vulnerability disclosures, who owns that knowledge, and how, what possibilities do you have to export that knowledge and to communicate about that knowledge. Okay. Yes. <laughs> what about your intellectual <laughs> property? <laughs> Well, uh, y y your the last words you said actually touched touched upon another issue: freedom of speech, right? Uh, it's uh, it's it's an it's an issue that I keep quite close to my heart. Again, as a libertarian, um, and well, of course, I personally look at at vulnerability information as as intellectual property and as freedom of speech. But uh, taking into account that most times, I'm not saying all times, but most times. A researcher does this intentionally, so intentionally looks for vulnerabilities. Uh, well, whatever Latvia will decide in the end, uh, a researcher can just take into account. I mean, if you're not okay with with, with giving your rights to use your intellectual property to to search, then then don't do that. Of course, there are those cases when this happens. Uh, unintentionally. I mean, I've had those cases myself. I, I've, heard, I, I've heard that some of the quite, quite uh, loud cases here in Latvia also, also happened like that. That person was not actually looking uh, for, for a vulnerability. So another important aspect is what, what do we do with those? I mean, if we, if we seriously want to look, at, uh, look into um, freedom of speech and, and, and copyright issues, even though Again, I personally think uh, copyright copyright should be fixed, but it's a different uh, different issue. You know, uh, it it it, it there, it's a global issue, but global issue um, another global issue is also responsible disclosure process, and I actually think we can finally f fix it from a legal perspective only by working together. Um, it's, it, it, it has to work on, well, United Nations level, uh, I would say, you know, it's, it's a long, long way there to do that, but that would, that would have multiple benefits, you know, we wouldn't have problems with, with, with cross-border responsible disclosure. Um, it, if we had support of all countries, we would easily be able to change all the international agreements that currently, for example, forbid Latvia from um, actually mandating that private individuals cannot get criminal protection from hackers. Uh, as, as far as I remember from, from our discussions in the working group, that, that was one of the aspects. So uh, there are some international agreements which Latvia is a part of, and, and we are not allowed to say, sorry, Latvian companies do not get 
uh, to, to go to the prosecutor if they are hacked in these cases. So I think m most of these things can be solved on international level. Uh, the question is when, when it's going to happen. Because luckily, uh, I, I say luckily uh, in, in this case, um, IT security and, and, well, bad hacks and bad hackers will not go away. And, and it will be on the agenda whether we want it or not. And I hope it will force world governments to work together and, and implement changes to protect themselves. Well, uh, I think uh, the time frame could be very long. I hope we will see the day when it's on the United Nations agenda. Uh, other questions from the audience? Okay, I'll ask one and then I'll ask you again. Bug bounties, what do you think about that? <laughs> I could give you some pros and cons, but I'm sure you can give some yourself. <laughs> so is it good or bad? <laughs> uh, to me, I don't think bug bounties are bad per se. I don't think that money should be a requirement uh, to do responsible disclosure. So, uh, because it, it gets tricky, you know, if you, uh, if you demand money, you get into extortion. Like if you don't disclose the vulnerability without receiving money, then it gets really close to extortion. So uh, that doesn't mean that companies shouldn't be able to, uh, to implement bug bounties as well. I mean, a lot of companies already do it. Um, and I can un also understand from the researcher perspective that you spend time and effort uh, in, you know, not just finding the vulnerability, but disclosing it, going to the organization, talking with them. It takes time, it takes effort. So uh, there, could, there, there can be some sort of compensation for that. Um, but it should, to me, it should not be a requirement for responsible disclosure. That should not be your main goal to get payments. Yeah, well, I think that... Uh Besides bug bounties, some other motivators also exist and they might be used as well. Uh, like for, for some people, especially for academia and students, uh, the just mentioning in, in government, uh, I don't know, news, news uh, in a web page or, or, or search LV website that maybe we have those top 10 guys or, or girls that, that are doing that and, and they have been successful and have done a lot of good with that is also something beneficial and, and uh, maybe some employer will look it up and they'll have a job opportunity, okay? But uh, yeah, well, for commercial sector, I think bug bounties is, is, is quite okay if they can handle that. And, and uh, for government, I doubt that it would be needed. Uh, good reaction, appropriate reaction is, is I think, the most uh, necessary part here. But uh, bug bounty from the government would be, I think, something that could work if you have ver something very specific that you would like to achieve and uh, you have limitations on time, then maybe bug bounty is also the way to go. Uh, well, you're probably talking about bug bounty programs, you know, uh, short, uh, short or, or sometimes indefinite uh, programs where you actually invite people uh, to hack you actively, like there are some different brokers for that. Uh, but uh, speaking, speaking on bounty, bug bounties themselves, where well, um, opinions uh, differ quite sharply between um, ac different academics working in the uh, cybersecurity field. Um, and, and I would like to outline those two different, different opinions. Um, one part says that, well, no part actually objects to bounties per se. The question is, um, should a bounty uh, reflect real, real value added to the company after the bug has been fixed? Should it, should it compete in market prices with different uh, other possibilities uh, for uh, that, that there are for that bug, uh, which Baiba showed on, on one of the first slides? Um, so one side, one side speculates that no, bug bounties are symbolic. So for example, um, uh, for, example for, for finding, uh, finding a bug that allows access to user data, um, a, normal, a normal bug bounty starts at uh, half a thousand dollars uh, currently uh, in, in the world and it goes, it goes up. And it's clearly below uh, black market level. So one part of these researchers, these scientists, um, they talk about the vulnerability surface, the possibility to exploit it, and uh, 
burning the vulnerability if it's used uh, if, if if it's used uh, well to to exploit it, not not to fix it. So uh, let's say there's a large social network and it has a vulnerability, um, and the researcher decides rather to go to the social network and receive a bug bounty of a couple thousand dollars uh, to sell it on the black market or gray market, say to some to some uh, allied government. Um, for for a larger sum. So the question is, uh, will these other brokers actually be able to offer a larger sum that um, the responsible disclosure process should be offering? Because, well, vulnerability can usually be used a limited number of times before it's discovered anyway. Um, there is risk, always risk for researcher of retaliation from, from the company itself. Uh, or, or some other government. And uh, one thing that can help with pushing the researcher to responsible disclosure process is actually regulation because black market is completely un unregulated, right? So that's one view. The other view, put quite simply, um, is what we saw quite sharply after Apple announced their bug bounty program. So apparently not all security researchers agree with this view I just, uh, I just proposed to you. Zerodium, which is uh, a gray marketplace for bugs, uh, they, they legally buy, buy bugs uh, from researchers and, and, they, and they sell it to um, organizations with the legal but maybe not ethical right to exploit those bugs. Just one of many organizations. They raised their prices for iOS, which is the operating system of Apple um, exploits so that they are above the level what Apple offers in their bug bounty program. So there are these, these two sides of the story. So one side says that no, uh, it's a symbolic amount of money and the, the other part of researchers believe that you should actually be uh, in the business of competing for the researcher, competing with the price. Well, that's an interesting approach. Would you like to add something? <laughs> I don't know, I probably from the government policy aspect, I think uh, this initiative and this policy and idea is not to, I don't know, bring a new jobs in a marketplace, so to say. <laughs> we are not creating jobs with that. I think it's more about bringing certainty and clarity and, and uh, uh, help those people who have, for various intentions, a willing and interest uh, to improve the digital. Uh, digital products, and I think with that uh, in mind, we don't focus on, on bounty programs. I think there is a multiple ways, and that will be also in our case how one can recognize someone's input and, and time, and it can be symbolic, it can be naming, it can be it can be different ways. So I, I don't see a problem on, on I, I see on the government side on, on private sector. I think you are free to do whatever you like. Uh, I think it's uh, every company can choose their way how they invest uh, finances, let's put it that way, in the cybersecurity. I mean, some can hire auditors, some can uh, put up a big bounty programs, some can hire just, you know, number of hackers or do hackathons or announce. It's, I mean, f for private companies, it's, uh, the choices are many and different. I think the question is, do you invest at all in your Cyber security, that's a, that's a different question whether uh, whether companies pay attention to it, but whether that's a bug bounty pro program for, for, for implementing such policy or it's uh, any other ways, I think it's not a, <laughs> it's oh. not a difference. I think it's more what, what, uh, what is important that uh, com more and more companies would care about that in general. Well, let's face it, from government point of view, of course, we cannot pay 100,000 for, for something. Well, at CERT, we are thinking of uh, making nice T-shirts for people that report uh, bugs. So I hope in the near future, if you get something useful, you'll get nice T-shirt. And uh, well, that will be our appreciation. And of course, if you want to, uh, that your name is publicly uh, announced, etc., then we are, all, will be, and we are already happy to uh, help with the publicity. So, let me ask again, do you have some questions in mind? Oh, two hands, great. <laughs> uh, I have two tricky questions. First question is, uh, what does, what's happened if the timeline of the, uh, when we, I found zero day is uh, ended? So, half a year, okay, so can I publish it? So that's one question. And second, uh, for example, the government uh, have applications uh, 
where they are owners only of information, not a service. So I hacked the service, I found the vulnerability in the service, but owner is government. So is this, uh, it's, it's tricky, I know, but it's uh, Well, a I good guess point. your questions are more related to the approach for legislation. Uh, maybe I'll quickly answer and then you can complement. So in, um, in the proposed legislation, CERT is uh, men meant to be as a middle ground uh, because uh, if there is a, a uh, vulnerability in state or local authority systems, CERT has to be informed anyway. So we decided that uh, the best way would be that CERT is involved directly from the beginning, no matter what is uh, the owner of the information system. On the top of that, we have very good uh, relations with uh, responsible people in all IT uh, departments of state and local authorities. So for us, it's easier to find with whom to talk there rather for, f than for a researcher who probably don't know those people so well. Uh, but of course, uh, we cannot stop researcher from contacting organization directly as well. That's part of freedom of speech. You can talk with whomever you like. So that's uh, one thing. And the other thing about the publication. So the question was if uh, the 90 days go by and 180 days go by, uh, it's still not fixed, but can you publish it? So who would like to comment on that? <laughs> I think none of well, Kirill probably has. Yeah, you have a lawyer uh, <laughs> uh, education. So, uh, my understanding is that you are free to do. I mean, you can publish whenever. You can even publish within those 90 days. But the question is, uh, it's more like it gives you an umbrella of certain protection. I mean, you are on your own, and then. Uh, if you publish, you have to bear the risks and face the legal consequences because that the, the time frame has expired. Uh, the time frame, the, you are not anymore sort of, we are not setting rules what happens afterwards. We are setting that up to that. So under, in that case, you are, not, you are not anymore sure the way you publish, whether that's not gonna hurt you. It's, we will not be able under the, the law uh, to, Ensure protection, I think. So, so, so legally, I have to I have to begin by saying I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> um, but um, according to this um, planned legislation, uh, VSS 448, when when it is passed, um, technicalities will still need to be uh, sorted out by the cabinet of ministers. And even though I believe in the working group currently we have some understanding uh, relating to what happens in these cases. Um, it's, not, it's not clearly written in the law. So the understanding as I remember it is that um, even though the slide shows that the process continues forward only when vulnerability is fixed, the text in, in, in the draft of the law actually says that um, response regarding status of the vulnerability, uh, not the initial response, but the second response, uh, that's, that's when you can continue the publication. So technically, uh, depending, uh, depending on what cabinet of minister decides later on, uh, I think CERT will have the power to, to, to push it forward, to say, okay, so when there is not fixing vulnerability, publish it anyway, it's for the interest of, the, of, of everybody. Um, <clears throat> when there, you know, we, we will only give vendor one day this time, uh, and, and you can publish immediately anyway because this is, this is you know, super important. It, I think CERT should be the one uh, doing these, w waiting the pros, pros and cons. That's about Latvian case, but, uh, well, but um, speaking, <laughs> yeah. That's huge well, responsibility on our shoulders. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that, that, that's how I see it, yeah. But uh, so speaking, uh, speaking about the principle of publishing in general, um, looking at it wider than, than what we are trying to make here in Latvia, um, I believe it is an important um, tool in the hands of the society, not just the researcher. Um, as, you, as you saw in my presentation, I mean, even though they did answer, okay, we fixed it, uh, I said I'm not sure they actually did. And, and we had a deadline even before they had, uh, even before they had communicated that a fix is ready. We had a deadline, first of October, and and deadlines are, are there for a reason. And I think it's a question of being able to choose them wisely, because what everybody has to understand is that vulnerabilities in publicly available or, or freely available uh, systems will not disappear because they are not disclosed. 
uh, the reverse process will happen. The more days a vulnerable system is online, the, lo the more likely it is that another, and then another, and then another person will find the same or similar vulnerabilities. And again, then it's the question of proportion of good guys versus bad guys on, uh, of those who find those vulnerabilities. Do you want to comment some more on this, or shall we go for the next question? <laughs> Just really quickly, I think that the publication of a vulnerability is uh, an incentive for an organization to fix the vulnerability. So the deadline is not for nothing. Um, however, I, you have some pretty strict deadlines. You say three months or six months. Uh, we would approach it from a different angle. So we say coordinated vulnerability disclosure, where you set a deadline together and you say what's reasonable. Um, and if for some circumstances the organization would not meet that deadline, you can either discuss for a new deadline, uh, but it should not be unending. So you should have very good communication between the hacker and uh, the organization to set a reasonable deadline, but it should still be the incentive. So you should be able to publish if a deadline is not met, but it's, it's quite a responsibility on the hacker's side to make a responsible um, weighing of interests in that case. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I think that uh, this is one of the drawbacks. If you want to put things in the law, you have to make specific numbers and specific uh, deadlines, and that's something we've been struggling with quite a lot, what, what it should be, and, if, and w in what circumstances these three months can be prolonged to six months, etc., etc. Next question. Hi, I have a question regarding this NICE directive, which uh, obviously we are still to write the legislation for it, but uh, it will regulate private sector or parts of private sector in some form. Do you see a place for responsible disclosure in this sort of uh, legislative framework, and if yes, to what extent? Well, the so the NIST directive goes for, or it, the scope of the NIST directive is essential services and digital service providers, and the scope of digital service providers is quite small. So I don't think the NIST directive would have such huge impact on the entire private sector. Um, but it does have a security requirement for parts of the private sector, and one of the arguments I've made in the past is that I feel that responsible disclosure could be a tool for organizations to also meet security requirements. Since you are knowledgeable, you, you get knowledge you wouldn't have otherwise, and you're, you would be faster able to fix those problems. Um, if the NIST directive is the right place to do that, I'm not sure. Um, but I do think that just having security requirements in law might also be an incentive for organizations to uh, implement responsible disclosure as well. I, I can only add, I agree that uh, I think there should be a general requirements. We, we had, we had, uh, we were presidents in one part of NIS, uh, the, the directive negotiation. I think it was a very heavy process. We learned a lot what one cannot do through regulations and I think uh, in particular in digital and IT field, I think less we can move into heavy EU regulation because it takes so many years once it's adopted that so many things are already outdated. So it's, I think, like, like you said, security per, as such has to be a component in, and has to be in a general lines required especially when it comes to essential and, and different scope or spe specific sectors, because it's also, we have a financial sector which has those regulations. We have sectors that actually do have regulations on, on, <coughs> on IT security in different uh, normatives. But uh, I think for responsible disclosure to be brought into something like directive, we can even see from, again, looking for our own experience to bring that into the law it is a very complicated and actually laws are not for that to be very prescriptive. They can't prescribe every single little thing starting from technical, all the tools or, or, or uh, all, the, all the details. So I think the law has to set the general principles. And of course there is always, there will be always space for interpretation and there will be always space to abuse some certain things. And of course it, it will be at the end left to the court decide but then you have those like like you had in your presentation those key components that are judged against whether the case is really 
to be fined or not. And so I think we have to be very flexible on how much we actually put into sort of hardcore legislation or, or even if we think about such as EU level directive. So I, I, would, I would be skeptic of putting, as, as, as you mentioned also, putting the, the policy itself in itself within EU legal framework. Well, I, I feel like I have to weigh, weigh in because uh, similarly to, to you, I was quite, quite close at the process. I was uh, the national uh, expert uh, for Latvia on an IS directive when we were the presidency. Um, well, I do believe there is a larger problem actually here, here at play. Uh, what, what we see now in its adopted form as the NIS directive, I'd say it's quite a soft document. Uh, it's, it's, it's far from the commission published initially a couple of years ago. Uh, so from, from the perspective of, of all European citizens, I would look at uh, the directive as a poster child, as, as the first, first uh, cybersecurity regulation of EU and, and, and nothing more. I, I, think, I think it's a flashy name, it's good that we have it. And, and uh, we, can, we can take a look at how, how it works. We can take a look at some of the tools that are in there. Uh, but uh, ultimately, we have to, we have to look at uh, creating um, some entirely new legislation. Maybe it's a bit too soon, right? Uh, <laughs> but we have to look at creating an entirely new legislation now that member states are actually uh, ha have seen that it's possible to discuss cybersecurity on EU level. OK, thank you. I have different questions so that we move a bit away from the legisla uh, legislation and government responsibilities. What about the software vendors? There are currently just two industries that are free of liability, and that's software and religion. Let's not talk about religion, but software. <laughs> Should there be uh, any legal responsibility for vendors to fix the bugs? Uh, what about naming and shaming to encourage them? What do you think? I'm going to say yes and pass the mic on because I did touch that in my presentation. Yes, please. Boris, you haven't spoken for long. <laughs> okay, so software liability. Yeah, I do feel that we could uh, improve liability for software vendors, absolutely. I think they, uh, they are held not responsible at the moment. And um, one of the things we face in practice quite often is that the security requirement, for example, on data protection, um, the processor, so the uh, data processor has to take security measures, but the data processor uses software he didn't make themselves, um, and he doesn't know how it works, etc. but he is liable for any flaws in the software they use if data is not protected properly. So they find themselves in a very difficult position. Uh, and I think from a legal perspective that liability should be divided or maybe even put on the software uh, developer if he does not take measures to improve his software. So yeah, I, I really feel that software developers should have a bigger role in terms of liability. Okay, what is? <laughs> uh, well, uh, maybe some part will be, will be Re rephrase, but still, I, my belief is that we we have to reach the level, the common level of of the understanding of the problem, and especially with this IoT thing. And uh, uh, I think we will see more and more of those vulnerabilities. And IoT industry will bring uh, quite a lot of uh, startups uh, there. And imagine if you have everything heavily regulated, also on the on the software liability and blah blah blah. And still, as a, a small country, we would like to support startups, right? Uh, so <laughs> we are stuck there, basically. So it has to be somewhere in the middle. And I think the, the, the understanding of the problem and accepting that we have to uh, deal with it, uh, I think uh, the legal framework here is not, not, uh, not the only instrument and not enough. So there has to be <laughs> common understanding of that. Yes, uh, please. So yeah, of course we should uh, support startups and Internet of Things, and everybody loves Internet of Things. Um, but I mean, it's a big risk as well. And I think that even a startup, uh, which might not have the resources, should always 
practice responsibly. So if you bring something new to the market uh, and you're aware of risks in it, you should fix those risks. Um, and, you know, to a reasonable extent, of course, but I do feel that just saying that you're a startup does not exempt you from liability or exempt you from responsibility, in my opinion. <laughs> this is a sensitive uh, subject. <laughs> well, uh, I think what Internet of Things is doing currently, uh, they have probably conspired and they have a motto, um, a vulnerability in every home, or, or, or rather, you know, five vulnerabilities per every fridge. Um, well, I think, I think we do need some certification, and our certification is usually expensive, and, and maybe what, what we as, as a country or maybe as a as European Union can do is understand that it's for the common good, and, and startups, yes, they are an important part of uh, modern day economics and, and country growth. So maybe uh, EU or, or, or some countries at least for start can take uh, the costs of the certification on, on their hands because it, it is horrendous what's happening with all the IoT vulnerabilities. And I support certification as, as far as we can, we can you know, have it without, without blocking any innovation. So we have to find the solution there. No, I'm not a software developer. Nothing so. <laughs> 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 okay, if there are there uh, other questions from the audience? Or you are already full of impressions and... <laughs> well, we have a few minutes left. Can we ask a question to the audience? Yes, you can. <laughs> Just take the microphone. <laughs> I know that uh, raising hands things doesn't work uh, really well, but still I, I'm going to try. Uh, could you raise hands who of you think that they understand what, what a responsible disclosure policy is and how it works? <laughs> okay, so about 50%, right? Well, here I would say 75 Okay. <laughs> in this room. <laughs> okay, so I think that uh, our, if, if we want to achieve something on that side, I think our, our all the task for uh, for us all is to to bring this message further and explain to other people who don't understand and i think that the general public should be also more informed on that topic because when we saw the the heart bleed uh, vulnerability that then uh, at least for for from the information we have in insert there were no uh, social networks like we have this local social network drug mlv there were no users who were eager to, to understand whether they are vulnerable there or no. They were not trying to contact the social network with questions, do you have this problem, have you fixed it, am I vulnerable, should I change the password? So it's, a, again, culture and understanding of the problem. Yes, I completely agree. Do you want to comment on, on that? <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just weigh in on another aspect of uh, vulnerability disclosure, so it's related to hard bleed. That's why it, 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 it sparked in my mind. Um, so when, when hard bleed happened, I was uh, one of the first independent researchers to, to um, create a publicly available tool to do that. So, and, and of course, um, I checked uh, if some of the local sites are, are, are vulnerable. So unfortunately, uh, one of the uh, one of the banks, one of the banks on the internet in Latvia were vulnerable to hard bleed. And, and the terrifying thing about this is that they never, as far as I know, they never told their users to this day, they have not told their users that they need to needed to change their passwords. So uh, e even if responsible disclosure as a process is not in place there, uh, I think we have to ask for some responsibility, a lot of responsibility from uh, the owners of the systems themselves, regardless of where the vulnerability comes from. And, and we have to, well, we have to have some, mm, some kind of legal tool in Latvia to uh, deter such kind of uh, irresponsible behavior. Okay, last chance, questions from you? Yes, there is one hand. What is actually made me think whether I do understand this responsible disclosure policy and there is one aspect I'm not sure about. I am not a researcher, but from time to time it happens that I do observe some artifacts which make me think that this thing on the other end might be vulnerable. Does it fall under this umbrella or I have to prove that there is real vulnerability? 
Boris, maybe you can tell about experience that we have for now. <laughs> okay, from a third LV uh, perspective, I would say that you have suspicion. It's enough for us that you inform and we will take a look at it. But uh, from RDP perspective, uh, the, the requirement is that you have a proof of concept. You define what you have uh, identified and, and uh, how we can check it. And then uh, the process goes on. So. It's two-sided, but from from Sertel V, if I can wear my Sertel V hat, then I say then you you're welcome to inform us in in any case. Anyone else? Okay, so the time is running out, and to conclude, uh, I think you mentioned already uh, several uh, pros and cons, uh, but now if we uh, so the min, uh, Committee of Cabinet of Ministers will look at the proposed legislations in two days, next Monday, in two working days. It will not be a solution on Monday, but we will see how it proceeds from there. Uh, I hope there will be a positive uh, decision and things will move on. And uh, as Minister uh, in the morning said, from 2018, uh, the policy will be in place. So how do you see what will be uh, the biggest changes when uh, this policy is in place? What, what, what do you foresee? Can you just give your shot? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll talk from third LV perspective. I think that uh, with, with this uh, formal way, uh, I foresee that third LV will be a, a parser, you might say. Uh, for, for, for technical people. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll have to create some kind of a methodology how to reasonably explain what they actually can do and cannot do uh, just because we have, a, uh, we have already grown to, to the quite formal and, and maybe for some people uh, hard to comprehend uh, framework. Okay, anyone else? So I don't know exactly for Latvia, but I guess legal certainty if you want to uh, do responsible disclosure in the public sector. Uh, but I do think that uh, Latvia could be a good example for other states that have quite strict regulation on subjects such as hacking and finding vulnerabilities, where the Netherlands has the luxury that we have a quite flexible legal framework and we uh, can do a lot through self-regulation. I can imagine there are other member states in the EU that have a stricter legal framework. Uh, your success could be an example for other states to do the same or to learn from Latvia on how to regulate this subject. So we will uh, see all the problems and all the mistakes we make and exactly. others will be able to avoid <laughs> those mistakes. Eva? Well, I think it will, uh, if, if the law changes will, adapt, will be adopted, it will uh, trigger a bigger sort of interest and concern or care, I don't know, for some institutions probably they, have, they will have to call up and ask what it is because we know that multiple things go through the cabinet and then once they are adopted only, people start to read what it is that was adopted. So I, I imagine it's gonna be either called to CERT or to Ministry of Defense or whoever will people think of uh, to be the ones to call and ask. I think it will be an incentive for many institutions actually to find out what information systems they have. <laughs> they will be surprised. I think on the, in the leadership, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying on expert level, but on leadership level, I think it's a, it's a very, very real situation that people who are managing, uh, who are doing technical stuff and part and who are actually heads of organizations not necessarily have that knowledge. Uh, they will find out who is the responsible one or whom do you call and ask about those things. So I, I hope it will generate more awareness of that whole uh, whole what we have, and then I think that we have not been maybe uh, successful when we look back with, with together with CERT, like trying to proactively educate and uh, stimulate that interest with other means, and this will kind of uh, will push a bit more institutions to find it out. And, uh, and then thirdly, of course, it will require a big educational work, uh, not only to respond to those who will ask, but I think to, to, to work with judges, to work with prosecutors, to work with multiple different institutions, how to address those things. So uh, 
I, I hope we will learn a lot from that. We will be able to share and maybe also uh, help other countries to maybe learn from our experience because when we address that issue during our presidency, knowing that Dutch will take in a year over and will push that issue on a bigger scale, we started to introduce and uh, there was not a very common attitude that uh, countries necessarily would support. So I think if we can, with what Dutch have done already, and if we can add to that our, our experience, that could maybe uh, trigger some bigger responsiveness also in a broader sense. Okay, Kirill, last words. We are running out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's, it's hard to disagree with, with, with Eva. Uh, I agree with anything, uh, everything she, she said just now. And uh, coming back to her first remark at the beginning of this panel uh, on, on the benefits of having a clear legal framework for that, I, I completely agree with that. But I do have to uh, point out some, some potential uh, pitfalls that Latvia may walk into if... if uh, um, if, if this regulation is adopted as, as it is. Um, again, it's great to have legal clarity, but currently researchers, uh, security researchers pay for, uh, well, legal uncertainty, they pay with legal uncertainty uh, by not having um, to do all, all the for formal paperwork. I mean, um, so my worry is, is that by specifying strictly in the law, that you only access the data as little as necessary, that you have to create evidence in a verifiable manner, you create more fracture points where a researcher could go wrong and actually increase um, likelihood, in some cases, of a researcher getting in uh, legal trouble for the same thing that he or she is doing this year uh, after we have the regulation. So. That is my concern. Uh, I understand and I know how, how those parts of, of the law project came to be, but still I would love to see them uh, a bit more flexible so the researchers are not repelled uh, by the new Latvian uh, RDP legal framework. Okay, let's give applause to our panelists. That's, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. I just want to say that we have to start somewhere. I think this is a good beginning. We'll see how it goes. Thank you very much for listening. And we have three minutes to get to the main hall for the closing plenary.